My name's Tim Markle. I am part of the Community of Practice on Autism Spectrum Disorder and Developmental Disabilities. Welcome to our Community of Practice on what we have learned from pivoting to teleservices for those with autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities. We're gonna hear now from members from the Next Step Clinic in Milwaukee and Marquette University about what they have done in pivoting to diagnost diagnosing and di diagnosing, not a word, diagnosing autism um, through telehealth. So I will let you guys introduce yourselves. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Tim. You know, it, it is such a new uh, journey that making a new word for it's a good idea, diagnosing. Um, <laughs> so it feels like that a lot of the time. And uh, I just want to thank you for having us here first. Uh, when I saw the COP notice come out that it was about the pandemic and that word pivoting, um, I was like, hey, Tim, we've been really busy. And you were like, really? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so, um, so we're excited to be here and to share um, all that we've learned and hopefully my dog will behave himself. Uh, he always likes to bark whenever I have talks. Um, so uh, I'm Amy Van Hecke and I'm here um, representing the, the Next Step Clinic and Marquette. So I'm at both places. Uh, and we also have Amy Leventhal, who's our Director of Clinical Services at Next Step and Ida Winters, who is a Family Navigator at Next Step. So we're gonna share the presentation today. Leah was unable to make it. So she's here in spirit. Uh, and also we have another Family Navigator that's often with us, Troni Small. So he's with us in spirit too. Um, so Tim, you said you'd let us explain it and that's the truth. Um, that's that paragraph there after our names <laughs> of all the partnerships that our clinic uh, is created from. So we're really, um, uh, Frankenstein is not a good word, but that's what I feel like sometimes in terms of our <laughs> amalgamation of all the different groups that we represent. So the, the clinic itself is a satellite clinic of Mental Health America, Wisconsin. Uh, with in partnership with Marquette uh, and the Milwaukee Coalition for Children's Mental Health. Uh, we're located at Next Door Foundation. And then some of our key partners are True Love Baptist Church and the Baptist State Convention, the Miracle Network, um, MATC, United Way, UWM, Alverno, MCW, the Children's Hospital, and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. So, <laughs> um, so that's kind of our, our structure uh, at the easiest way to go with it is it's a satellite clinic of Mental Health America, Wisconsin. Um, and, um, and I'm part of one of the co-directors there uh, and that's where Marquette comes in. Okay, all right. So what have we learned and what we're, uh, first disclosure. So we have our standard kind of disclosures that we um, derive no additional income from promoting these different services. We're not paid by the BOSA people or the TELASC people <laughs> when we get into talking about those measures we've used. Um, beyond sort of our, our employment with the clinic or with Marquette. Okay, so um, overview just to orient us to what we will talk about today. Uh, we'll give you kind of a background on the clinic itself, a little more than just that long list. Um, and then I thought it would be kind of neat, and it was kind of neat for me even to like look back and say kind of like, where were we when the pandemic hit? Uh, what was our clinic like? What were we doing? What was that day like? And for us, the pandemic hit the day we had to vacate the clinic. Um, uh, you know, uh, we'll go into that a bit. I just gonna talk about that, but I'll just say that, that where we were that day was a huge team effort too, because I had just gotten back from a trip to Mexico where I almost got stuck in Mexico um, and had been exposed to COVID in O'Hare airport. So I was quarantined. I think Amy Leventhal was also quarantined. Um, so a, a large chunk of our team was quarantined the day we had to vacate. <laughs> so it was really an interesting day and it lives in my memory. Um, what were we doing pre-pandemic pre diagnostically? What were we structured and doing uh, back then? And then how did we respond? How did we shift? What did we do? How do we keep going? Um, because we never closed. Um, so that's something else uh, to, to sort of um, uh, emphasize is that we never dismissed trainees and we never closed. We, we stayed open the entire time, uh, which, which was a different thing than we saw happening in, in some of our community. Um, and then where are we today and what have we learned and what can we take away from that? Okay, I'm gonna turn it here over to Ida to talk about the clinic overview. So hi, I'm Ida Winters. I'm family navigator with the Next Step Clinic. So we were funded January, 2019. It was like the coldest day ever. And we were funded by, we won the President's Challenge from Milwaukee, from Marquette University. And we opened that October on Halloween day. 
so we're located inside the next door clinic on 29th and right, I believe it is. And um, our clinic was designed to improve the access to ASD and mental health care for underserved families in the community or Milwaukee. So there's a lot of families that are missed because of access to it. So when we moved there in the heart of the city, it was easier for people to have access. So um, our values and services are steered by a community advisory board. We have 12 members of the community on our community advisory board from different organizations throughout the city of Milwaukee, throughout the Milwaukee County, the state of Wisconsin and the country. So um, we came in addressing the shortages of providers by training disciplinary clinicians for the future and we service children aged 15 months to 15 years old, my son being 13 when he was serviced. And um, some of our referral sources are pediatrician, birth to three, churches, church ambassadors, school, foster care workers, lots of self referrals and a lot of time um, word of mouth. And we have a community partnership model with services of family navigation, where we provide screening um, for ASD or other de developmental disorders evaluation. And we have a team made up of family navigators, practitioners, teachers, students, graduate students, and all of the rest. We offer um, therapy as in parent-child interactive training in partnership with UWM and um, we also, also offer early Denver, early start Denver model therapy for families. Next slide. So March 16, 2020, where we were, um, we had been open for four months, did 34 assessment cases, 10 actively attending appointments. 10 family navigation cases only, no therapy because we hadn't started therapy yet. We had six graduate trainees, practicum students or practicum students, two family navigators, one clinic assistant, 10 member community advisory board, two executive co-directors, one director of clinical services, two faith-based outreach partnerships between um, churches. Um, we also had um, six disciplines, um, which I, I, oh, well, psychology, master psych, PhD school psych, um, speech pathology, and PhD clinical psychology. Next. So in this picture here, you'll see our calendar looked like last March. And as you can see, it's pretty full. But those are all the people and available times slides we had. We were open, we were really open and ready and waiting for families to come in and service them. You can see one of our beautiful rooms at the clinic. We, when we have families come, on, come in, we want them to be comfortable as possible. And we, we're there sitting like we're having a conversation instead of asking everything you can remember since the day you were born. And here's the, at the top, you see we have the big check that we were awarded from the President's Challenge and some of our team you can see in the picture. And this was ribbon cutting day, which was January 7th, I believe of 2020. And at the bottom, you can see um, students in our clinic working together and consulting on cases. Next slide. Okay, this is for Amy Leventhal, I'll turn it over to her. Hi, I'm the other Amy, and I, I've been the other Amy since kindergarten, so I'm totally good with that. And I also respond to Amy L. Um, and if you're, you know, 10 and under, you can call me Dr. Amy as well. Um, okay, so I am the director of clinical services. So um, I'm in charge of training and supervising the graduate students that are providing the diagnostic evaluations so that we can increase the capacity out there. These students can um, graduate, go out there and know what, um, what autism looks like and be diagnosticians in the future, hopefully, or, um, or be uh, identifying kids on the spectrum earlier and getting them to services. 
what we were doing before um, that faithful day in March, which um, seemed like a black and white line for us, although we know the pandemic happened in a really different way than it, we experienced it at our clinic. But we were, um, were providing services with um, family navigation coming first and foremost for our families. So we're serving families that are um, from the, um, the urban environment, um, families that are historically underserved, families of color um, that um, have, have not had great experiences with accessing services um, and with responsiveness from services. So we use our family navigators to help families not only um, under, it just under, it's overwhelming. So coming into services, knowing who you're going to, what, what it's going to be about, we're trying to navigate families from the start all the way through and after the evaluation um, so that they can figure out what to do and not be um, as overwhelmed and build a trusting relationship with us. So Ida and Troni are our family navigators and they would con um, be in contact with families after a referral and connect with them um, and schedule a screening so that we're um, figuring out what the family needs and if they need a diagnostic evaluation. So um, if they needed something else, the family navigators would help, um, help support the families to um, to connect with who they needed to connect with and what they needed and educate them on, on where they're going and why. Um, for the families that did, um, the, the kids got screened and they did need a diagnostic evaluation, they would come um, and be uh, handed off to our student clinicians in a, um, what we call the handoff appointment, which um, other people might think of as an intake, but it was important for us to have the family navigators there and the student clinicians so that those families felt like um, not as overwhelmed and knowing that the family navigators were, were there with them to support them. And we'd uh, gather um, basic developmental and child history in that first handoff appointment. And then um, we would have a series of um, follow-up appointments to gather information specific to look at um, diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. So that involved um, doing a, a, a range of sessions and we were trying to be responsive to what families needed. So I'm not gonna get into it in great detail, but uh, sometimes it was a lot of appointments. Sometimes it was uh, shorter appointments. We were trying to um, be responsive. We were already being responsive and pivoting and ready to pivot when we came into creating the clinic. So um, pandemic be damned, we were ready for it. So um, the um, sometimes the appointments were multiple appointments and sometimes they were like longer appointments with multiple of these aspects of the assessment happening in one session versus multiple sessions. But what happened in all of those evaluation sessions were um, always included um, an observation assessment um, of the child in interaction with the clinician and with the parent. And we were using the ADOS, which is considered a gold standard for diagnostic evaluations um, for autism. And ADOS is, stands for Autism Diagnostic Observation System. And it's a series of play activities for older um, individuals. It's conversations and social interactions. Um, so there's some fluidity and flexibility in there, but there's standardized prompts and a standardized scoring system that allows, um, allows one to get a score and um, indicate a likelihood of autism. So we're using the ADOS. We were also um, interviewing the parent and we were using the autism diagnostic interview for that, which um, also is standardized and provides scores um, for uh, linked to the diagnostic criteria. We were also doing when appropriate uh, cognitive assess assessment um, that um, was either more of a screening rating scale 
um, an information or a one-on-one -on -one structured standardized individual um, assessment for cognitive abilities and achievement testing and adaptive um, skills. But we were also being um, sensitive to families, where the child was, what information we had, and whether that was um, uh, necessary for not just the diagnosis of autism, but how can we understand this child and help guide them to um, recommendations that made sense. So you can imagine, we can switch to the next slide, um, the pieces that um, when we couldn't see families in person, um, we hit some obstacles. Um, so we shifted to telehealth. This slide has um, how we responded to the pandemic and I'll, um, I'll go through them. We had to immediately shift to telehealth. Um, first, we had to get out of the clinic, um, which was a feat because Amy and I couldn't be there. <laughs> and we we're on the phone. We weren't even on Zoom at that time. We we're just on phone calls trying to figure out, okay, what do we need to take? Because we're in the Next Door Foundation, which is an amazing space, but it's also a, a school and the school was shutting down and they weren't gonna let us into the building. So we had to figure out what we needed. So we gathered all of the assessment materials, the protocols, our, um, um, our files and tried to scan in our files and figure that out. So um, all of our team were amazing that day. We um, then um, transitioned our all of what we were doing into telehealth services. So that included supervision meetings, um, community advisory board meetings, and we had to train, retrain the staff, the clinicians, and the students all in telehealth practices. First, we had to learn them ourselves. So we had to figure out what were the best health, best practices in telehealth for psychological services. Um, and then how do we most efficiently and effectively train everyone to understand and be on the same page with what practices we were doing? Um, okay, I went into the scanning of the files. Um, we also realized that the families with whom we work um, uh, often don't have the technology that's needed for telehealth. Sorry, I'm, we're... We're dog sitting, so it's my turn for the dogs going nuts behind me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we um, we secured technology for our families um, because many of our families don't don't may not even have reliable phones um, for uh, telehealth services. So we got um, laptops and hotspots and figured out a system for getting those to families. Um, in a way that was safe for everybody. Um, we hired someone to be our courier for um, those materials. Um, it included technology, but also included getting families paperwork, um, families that you know you take it uh, for granted if you have a, a laptop where you can sign um, sign papers on your laptop, or you can, you have a printer at home and you can print and then sign consent forms and those kind of things. So we had to work through how to, um, give families the information about, um, informed consent and our practices, get their signature. Um, so some of that was done through our courier or all of that was done through our courier as well. Um, when families didn't have email and computers, um, computers at home. Um, we created kits for the packets for um, our consent paperwork, and then we created tool uh, toy kits as well for, and at that point we were transitioning to assessment and treatment, so needed um, kits for our treatment services as well. And then we provide, we, we procured sanitizing and um, pandemic safety equipment. So yeah, that was, was a huge learning curve about how to clean our toys when they came back to us and what was the most effective way to do that. Um, so um, I think that covers that. We, we also were realizing as everyone was back in April of last year, 
that um, if there's too many people on a Zoom call, then it, the Zoom call crashes. And our, our clinic was set up so that um, our trainees could be there. And if they didn't have a client that they were seeing, they were able to observe in a separate room via video feed. And so then we had to rethink how to maintain our training experiences for our students while not overwhelming the Zoom um, or Zoom meetings with families and figure out also how I could supervise students on Zoom calls um, and, um, and make it all work in this different environment. And now it seems like it's going so smoothly. It's like, oh yeah, we really had to think about all those things. Um, we, we did, um, Amy joined um, uh, international and national um, COVID autism diagnostic and research groups to learn what other people were doing. There were many people in, across the nation trying to figure out how do we do this and how do we do it differently. Um, we, in the meantime, while we had families that were scheduled and we didn't have a plan for um, how we were gonna, uh, what other instruments were out there and how we were gonna um, provide the assessments, we created new interview measures for some older kids. We were evaluating a um, child who was 11 and a child who was 14 and how do we do that over telehealth? Um, and what does that mean for what we're looking at? Um, and, you know, if someone's having a, a conversation via telehealth, will, you know, if you, if you look at the person, you're not even, to make it look like you're making eye contact, gazing at the person, you really have to stare at your little, your little video um, light and um, the camera, and it doesn't even make sense to look at that via telehealth. So we really had to rethink um, our use of the clinician versus the parent in our um, evaluating our social interactions. Um, so we created our own, we took the ADOS and we took the ADI and we figured out what we needed to adjust and modify. And then as we were also learning um, new measures. Let's see. We shifted consent. Um, I think I talked about that. Um, we shifted how we were doing handoffs. Um, we shifted um, how we were doing screenings. Um, Ida and Tony were going to homes to do um, screenings many times and we were we adjusted there. Um, and then we also adjusted how much uh, we really streamlined our evaluations to decide, okay, what's what's necessary and important and what can we recommend that a child gets evaluated um, for later on to get them um, to get them the, the start of opening that um, the doors if they have a, a diagnosis and get them the services that they need um, and potentially have further evaluation happen later on down the road. Um, we modified um, the ADOS, but then we also discovered um, a couple of um, measures which have been amazing. And I think if someone had asked me last January, January, 2020, if um, autism diagnostic evaluations can happen over telehealth, I might've giggled and said, no. <laughs> and I have been, and I was skeptical going forward, but we thought, well, this is what we've got. We are gonna try it and let's see how this goes and how confident we are with the, um, the um, information that we're getting via telehealth. And um, there's a group at Vanderbilt that fortunately was already um, trying to figure out how to service families um, that lived in very rural areas of Tennessee and could not access diagnostic evaluations for autism because of the distance um, from between them and the service providers that were often like in big cities and um, in Tennessee. So they had created this tele-ASD PEDS, which is a um, telehealth um, assessment procedure for very young children evaluating autism. And it's for kids um, 
in their first, their, their second year of life, somewhere um, around 15 months old until age three. And it is short and it needs very little um, in terms of toys and materials. And it is amazing. It has been really amazing in providing us information that is that feels um, feels like we have a, can have a good level of certainty with many many kids. It's not perfect for all of all kids. And one one aspect that I really like about it is it it has it has a score that you, that it provides with the likelihood of autism, but then it also has a certainty level that you. Um, as a clinician can provide a, a level of certainty based on what you've observed. So when, when the experience of that assessment is, is low certainty, um, we can have a different path for those families um, and recommend an in-person um, reevaluation as soon as possible. Um, also, um, Catherine Lord, who created the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation System um, pivoted. She and her team were thinking, okay, how do we do this? And created, um, and I, I think it was all, it's based on the, she created an assessment that's, that's uh, we can do through telehealth called the BOSA. Um, Behavior Observation System for Autism. I'm not even sure what BOSA stands for at the moment. Um, and it's, it takes pieces of the ADOS and then also components of um, some um, assessments that they, um, her team are doing to look at changes in um, children um, with autism that are getting treatment. So um, trying to be sensitive to observing changes um, related to autism. So she created the BOSA from, from those two measures and it's uh, that has some more materials. So for the BOSA, we need to drop off these um, packets of toys at, diff at families' homes, but we can also use the BOSA to evaluate children over age three and all the way through adolescence. So, um, so we've been able to use the BOSA. Um, so the students have learned a, a ton in addition to um, learning the ADOS. They haven't had a lot of chances to use the ADOS. Um, since March, they haven't used it at all, but they've, they've learned these new measures as well. Um, I think that covers it. I touched base on, um, we, we do have um, families where we've provided the diagnosis. Um, and we had, let's see, Amy, I'm going to jump the gun a little bit. You had mentioned that we've completed 45, um, yeah, 45 assessments to date. And the week of the pandemic was the first findings meeting that we were going to have. So, so really we've completed 44 evaluations within the pandemic. And there's about five of them um, off the top of my head that I know that we've recommended. We've provided um, a determination of, um, of a diagnosis or not a diagnosis, and then referred them to get a secondary evaluation within six months or as soon as they can um, to be looked at face-to-face. -face. So I'll pass it back to you, Amy. Um, okay. Yeah. And, um, I don't know too, whether, um, I think it's, it's too early, but I think what would be fascinating for us too, is to think going forward is in those four or five, right. Those kiddos that are, um, we just really can't get the enough information from telehealth. Like, are there ways to see that earlier? Right. So I think that's something we'd love to work on some more. Um, uh, you know, I think like the same thing as Amy said, I think if you had said to me in January, we would be doing this, I would have laughed. Um, but then again, if you had said to me, you know, five years ago that we'd have a clinic, I would have laughed. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that I think what Amy mentioned about like that we were already really questioning a lot of things and already being really flexible and already pivoting based on what families needed. It really made it easier for us to readjust, right? So 
Um, I think Tim, you mentioned earlier about being curious and about, um, I would say then adding to that, like just being, being flexible and feeling like, you know, like really trying to figure out, okay, with these, these cases and these families, like Amy said, what information do we need, right? So like, I think if we had stuck ourselves in this, like we have to do ADOS, but so you can't do an ADOS would have meant we would have shut down if we had been inflexible about that. But rather the question became, how do we get the information we need to, to, to ascertain, does this child need a diagnosis or not? And so that's really an interesting question that we really have been chewing on all year. It's like, what is the information? And what are the sources of information and how can we access that to make sure that, that, that families and kids get the services they need and the diagnosis they need. Um, so where are we today? Um, we have, an, in terms of our case numbers, we're at 151. Um, three families right now actively being assessed. And, that, and you mentioned the 45. Um, so that's a number um, I want to draw attention to because I think it's something that has been a challenge for us this year is that if anything, and it's hard to tell whether it's because we're a new clinic that's gaining ground or whether it's a pandemic, um, our, our numbers really skyrocketed in terms of referrals. So pediatricians, et cetera, we're getting many, many referrals. But as you can see, 150 versus 45, um, families are struggling to get through this um, on telehealth. And, and we don't, or in general, we're not sure if it's telehealth, we're not sure if it's the pandemic, um, but we have quite a lot of cases that, um, that are taking a long time to, to, to actively materialize. And it's hard to know, like I said, it's hard to know whether that's pandemic oriented, whether that's family circumstances oriented, whether that's telehealth oriented, where that's coming from. Um, I would say that we noticed this early too, back in October, Halloween, easy to remember that date. Um, and that like our initial thoughts about student, like the way I can remember is I remember thinking about student caseloads and how we conceptualized that back then. So back then it was like, okay, each student's gonna have like two to three cases per month. And what we saw happening was that cases needed much longer. There were much more variable, like some cases could finish in two weeks, some cases needed months to really figure out and go through this process. And luckily we were able to do that, but we right away said, okay, let's let our students have X number of cases at a time rather than limiting it to in this month or in that month. So we saw this early on that families were gonna need more time. Um, and I think the pandemic exacerbated that to some degree. So we're lucky that we're able to keep families for very long periods of time. We do have a system where after a certain number of missed appointments, we kind of um, shift them back to family navigation um, and then basically say like, when you're ready, we're here for you. So that's kind of how we've handled it is, is by keeping family navigation active, we're able to shift them back to that versus being actively assessed. And then they can go back and forth um, as needed. So I think during the pandemic, we had um, a family probably come in in November of 2020 that had initially been referred to us in November of 2019, you know, so um, it had a very complex family situation that needed that leeway um, in terms of, um, how that process plays out. Um, and also needing the leeway sometimes in terms of what families are ready for. So that's another thing we see quite a bit is sometimes we get these referrals, but the families are really not ready to start the process. And if you contact them right then, it might be two, three months before you hear from them um, versus like a self-referral might be ready, right? So we're seeing kind of different patterns of where families are at in their journey. Um, we do have a number of cases mentioned earlier that are family navigation only that are maybe have already have a diagnosis and are just sort of lost in the system and need some help navigating treatments and services. Um, we did start our therapy uh, line uh, in the pandemic, and that's been an interesting journey. Um, and if Amy's probably the other one to speak to this, but just in terms of um, really questioning um, cultural acceptability. Of, of therapies and, and when you read papers that say, well, the outcomes don't differ by race or ethnicity or, you know, or we didn't see any differences in dropout by race or ethnicity. But then when you actually start implementing a therapy, is it really acceptable or not? When do families drop out, right? When do they stay? Um, at what point do they say, mm, I'm done, I'm good, <laughs> you know? And so we still have some questions around the therapies that we're offering and, and how acceptable they are and why, um, and trying to kind of really think carefully about that. Um, we still have all of our staff that we had, so that's fantastic. We added uh, that courier clinic assistant. 
Um, we've added members to our advisory board. We still have our core team. So we've held together through thick and thin, <laughs> through too many Zoom calls. Um, where things have dropped would be with our faith-based outreach groups, I would say. So we've done a lot of talks as a clinic um, over the pandemic to different groups, the Grand Rounds and things like that. But our church training, like you'll notice on that, maybe you notice on that picture that Ida showed with the calendar, you know, there was a training at Betty Brand Children's Museum. There was a training at um, True Love Baptist Church. There was a training at, you know, New Hope Baptist Church. Um, that really kind of went poof. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, so, um, you know, as those institutions, as churches closed, as Betty Brand closed, we really were just struggling to maintain like our cases uh, in terms of the, the cases coming through for assessments and therapies and the, the you know, the, the whipped cream on top of the Sunday of all the trainings really kind of went on hold. And so we're hoping to kind of reinvigorate that now that things are settling and vaccinations are really improving. Um, but that's kind of where I would say like what got back burner to be honest. Um, and then beyond that, I think part of that as well from our perspective was we had so many referrals that what those trainings tend to do is increase referrals. <laughs> so I think for part of us too was like, okay, we maybe need to pause on these outreach talks because we don't need any more outreach at the moment, <laughs> even though we want people to learn, we're not sure where to send them if we can't take them, right? So, and, and we heard this happening everywhere that different hospitals and neural psych clinics were just no longer even taking waitlist families um, because there were so many referrals. Um, and then the last piece is, I would say, is that our disciplines got winnowed as well. So, um, you know, as different disciplines like speech pathology really had to manage their speech path clinic and their speech path services, and we were all pivoting and, it, and the ability to collaborate did kind of contract um, with some disciplines that were really struggling to manage their own adaptations. Um, so we did get winnowed down, I would say, to more the psych disciplines, but then adding in some different ones that saw ways that we could work together and kind of pool our resources. Um, so nursing, for example, uh, pediatrics. Um, so we're still interdisciplinary, but I would say, given to what Amy said about the Zoom calls and everything else, um, some of that kind of um, got contracted down, I would say is the best way to describe it. Um, so our takeaways, uh, we are actually calling families, I think this week, to return to the clinic. So we're super excited. Next door has reopened. Yes, <laughs> thank, thank God. Um, and next door has reopened and we've been invited back with, we, we had to create a return plan that gates our services with the Milwaukee County Health Department um, uh, pandemic stages. Um, so we have kind of gated like what we're going to do based on what the prevalence is in, in the county. Um, and so we're at a stage now where we're not, not in the best place, to be honest, right? Milwaukee's kind of uh, in terms of COVID right now, even though vaccinations, right? We have the variants coming in and kind of increasing our rates. So where we're at now is bringing back those inconclusive kids uh, is where we're starting. So we're bringing back the inconclusive kids for what pieces they need. We're doing parts of the ADOS where we need to be um, briefly unmasked so we can smile at the child. We're doing that outside or through a glass window. <laughs> you know, um, we're doing what we can do to be safe um, while trying to get in the kids that really were inconclusive. Um, we'd like to retain telehealth because we did see that it helped families. It helped families access our services, especially families who have transportation challenges. You know, you've got a couple of kids and one on the spectrum potentially and navigating the buses. Um, the telehealth, um, especially when we can drop off laptops and hotspots, was really helpful for families. So we want to retain that. And especially as we're gating with the, the county um, for things like parent interviews and meetings and supervision, why not keep those on Zoom? You know, like we've all learned how to do this now. We might as well keep it for some time. So we'll see where we go. Um, we also want to retain some of the streamlining that we did. And we're questioning a lot of how much is necessary to diagnose ASD, what types of kinds of presentations can be diagnosed more quickly versus might need more in-depth assessment. So we're questioning some of these ideas around, um, and this is partly coming to from some of the, the international work groups. There's a group in Canada that has um, a lot of, um, uh, Lonnie Zweigenbaum and group that have a lot of kind of papers on, like there are certain cases of autism that may not need these like, huge assessments and that these multidisciplinary complex evaluations that are actually 
contributing to our bottlenecks because there are not that many teams like that to access. So if we say all autism cases need to have these monstrous, really cool, really informational uh, multidisciplinary evals, it means we have you know, fewer options for families to do that with versus might there be some cases of autism that could be diagnosed in a relatively streamlined way. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of asking those questions um, and trying to retain some of that. Um, we also want to help train collaborating providers. We'd like to see more diagnosticians <laughs> out there um, than just us. So, you know, really keeping an eyeball on who's referring to us. And if we see a PhD clinical psych referring to us, like maybe let's draw that person into the fold and train them <laughs> because you're, if you have the credentials to diagnose, maybe you should be rather than referring, especially if it's these cases that are relatively streamlined and not super complex in terms of their profiles. Um, meanwhile, mentioning super complex and profiles, the trauma ASD overlap and continuum. That's where we really see um, some work to be done that we hope to do, that we're thinking on and chewing on um, as part of the more complex kind of presentation. Um, and as part of the fact that the pandemic has been traumatic for a lot of people. Um, and we've all kind of probably acknowledged this, right? That like children in this pandemic have had a different life experience. They have had um, less social interaction. They have had a lot of instability in their homes and in their lives. Their family has experienced a lot of stress with employment, with sickness, with schooling. So we're gonna have to ask these questions coming forward of like, what's trauma, what's autism, what's both? And how do we understand how to delineate those things? So that's something that I think we're very interested in as a group. Um, and then continuing as well to modify and understand cultural acceptability for treatments and for diagnosis too. Um, one of the early things that we um, really asked about with cultural acceptability of how we do diagnosis is simple things we, that, that we, you know, you, you, you knee jerk reaction, right? You do things the way you've always done them just because you do. Um, and that's a question we ask in the clinical clinic a lot. Um, so something like a feedback session with families, right? It used to be that we would say, well, we need every person at the table that saw that child um, during that feedback session so that they can present their information to the family. But then what does that look like? That looks like a table of white people staring down one parent who is sitting there alone on the other side of the table and, um, and maybe is, is you know, a different background than the clinicians. And that's intimidating and that's upsetting and it's emotional and does it have to be that way? So with what we've learned from technology, can't we have the team like on a phone call or on a Zoom call and just have maybe one or two people with that family when we're telling them what our findings were? And so that's one of the things we've kind of decided um, going forward is giving families choices of what would you like your feedback session to look like? Who do you want there? Um, uh, what would make you most comfortable? Because if we lose families at the feedback, you've lost them right before that big journey of what are we doing next? And it's really, um, really, a terrible thing to lose them at that point. So really asking a lot of hard questions that, and sometimes people don't want to hear those questions because they're like, but I want to be there, that feedback. And you're like, yeah, but you don't really have to be, <laughs> you know? So, um, so there's hard questions to ask and we hope to continue to do that. All right, um, so here's our team. Uh, like I said, it's, it's large and it includes our outreach team um, as well as our partners, our, our supervisors. Uh, also the interdisciplinary supervisors, also our trainees and who we're training on who's still in the clinic as a prox student um, and how that is going forward. So just go through that really quick. And then um, that's where our physical location is. So we're super excited <laughs> to be back there uh, starting maybe next week, I think. Um, and here's our contact information and our website. If you have any questions um, or wanna reach out to us or if you're interested in sending us referrals, if you have any, um, that's our, our help address, it's our referral line. Um, we'd be happy to talk with you more. Um, and just a thank you and kind of our, um, our vision is that we have to keep moving forward and we have to figure out ways to do that that are acceptable and, and wanted for families uh, and helping families get access to what they need and what their kids need to reach their full potential. So well, thank you very much and we'd be happy to take questions. Ida, Amy and Amy, thank you so very much. There's just, so much in here, but that whole sense of moving forward, but doing it in a smart way, in a way that is actually going to help other people move forward, which means we need to listen to them to know what they need to move forward instead of just moving forward for the sake of progress. So I love 
so much that I've heard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, number one, ask if I can get a copy of the PowerPoint so that I can share it with attendees. And then two, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to unpin you guys from the screen so we can then open it up and see what kind of discussion we can have. So if you would like to stop sharing that, you're so ahead of the game. Just give me one moment. 